Let's get started. Uh, so, where's my presentation code going? Oh, I was supposed to click that earlier. Um, so, go ahead and fill it in here. It'll also remain in the bottom right whenever the slides are up. Um, so, obviously, when I'm in the new book, notebook, it won't be there, but for the rest of the time, it's there. But let's go ahead and get started. We're already a little after. And at least it should stay up. Yes. Okay. So, I recognize that it's small, uh, but there it is. All right, so today we're going to talk about representing relationships as tables. Um, we talked about tables a little bit last time, but first some announcements. Uh, so somehow, even though I'm certain I fixed question eight and question nine in the homework, uh, it managed to get through to you anyway. Uh, so please ignore questions eight and nine and don't use the greater export. Use the way we taught you in discussion, which was like file download. Okay, to do your submission of your homework. If you haven't done it already or you haven't run into this or haven't seen this on Piazza, I'm just repeating it here. The next thing, uh, please do not sit in those two rows if you get here on time or early. Okay, that way, because as you all, I'm sure, have at least some experience with, getting between classes can be really difficult on this campus. So if anybody's late, they have someplace easy to sit that doesn't make them walk across the stage when they want to go, right? Um, then the last thing is, uh, so if you are late though, sit in one of those seats, come in that door. Um, you know, I also like that door back there, but you know, that's up to you. Um, on attendance, I'm still working through why Top Hat wants to charge you money. I think it's because I'm using a feature I don't really need and can turn off. But I have an open ticket with them, so I'm still waiting on the answer to that. So hopefully we'll iron that out. Uh, if you're late, the attendance code should be in the bottom right corner whenever the slides are up. Okay. And if you, for some reason, can't mark yourself as in attendance at the end of class, just see Rohan. He's usually right here. And he can fix it for you. Sorry. Right. Uh, I'm going to have a sip of water so that I can talk. It's so much easier when I have this in here. All right. Um, actually, Roland, can you check the Zoom and just make sure you can hear it? All right. Any questions? Yeah. What is what is the code? I can't. Remember. Yeah. Um, it apparently requires binoculars. It is eight eight four two. All right, so our first question. Are you paying attention? Yes or no? We'll make sure your participation grade reflects that. All right, so as you can see, the way this works, um, you just you know pick your answer. Um, you should be able to do it on your phone as well as on a, a computer. Um, I think many students prefer to do it on their phone because then the computer can be like open doing notes or whatever. Um, but it's up to you. There will be random. There will be a random number of questions randomly distributed through each lecture uh, because it gives me a sense of whether you're paying attention and as well as like are you getting this point so that we can make sure that we go back to something uh, if you don't seem to be. Um, and then I get a counter down here. Uh, I won't always wait till um, everybody, apparently the attendance code is going to pop up now. Um, that was cool. Uh, so uh, I won't always wait till everybody has answered. So try to get an answer in quickly because obviously the longer I have to stand here with a you know pregnant pause, the more boring it is for me and for you. Uh, so if you don't get it in, it's not the end of the world, but do try to answer quickly. That way we can kind of move on. Um, my little controller is missing. All right, so 100. What is going on, Greg? 
It literally just canceled out of the uh, presentation. All right, let's try that again. All right, so it has decided to give you a new code. I don't think you need to worry about it. Um, if you are, if you haven't put it in, use the new code, which I believe is 4481. Uh, if you've already put it in, don't worry about it. It's going to come back to us with a time date stamp. So we'll figure out that it's the same class, even if apparently Top Hat can today. All right. So, all right. Getting into it a little bit. Um, so we want to talk about cause and effect a little bit. Uh, and so here's another example where, uh, you know, is there a correlation here? Is there a causal relationship here? Uh, you know, just kind of a vague association or, you know, which, which one of those kind of is it? Uh, so as you can see, um, clearly as you eat more, or basically as the reduction of margarine has taken place, so people have stopped eating margarine, has also helped with divorce rates, right? So does that make that makes perfect sense. Clearly, real butter is going to make relationships stronger than fake butter. I think is the takeaway. Uh, does that sound plausible? What do you all think? Raise your right hand if you think there's definitely a causal relationship here, or raise your left hand if you think it's a correlation. Okay, so I'm going to say correlation, right? They just seem to travel together, right? Um, however, it's probably not even a correlation. It might just be an association. For example, like, do you really think that if margarine spiked here, right, that divorce rates will necessarily follow? Or not, not because of a causal relationship, but even a real correlation, or does it just happen to be that margarine consumption is trending downward in recent years and divorce, uh, you know, per capita kind of, um, divorce rate in Maine specifically um, is also trending down, right? So they're not actually kind of related. They're just associated. They just happen to be going that way together, but there's, they're probably not being influenced by the same kinds of factors. They just happen to go together. And so this is kind of what we mean that there's maybe an association here but probably not even a correlation and certainly not a causation. Okay. As weird as Mainers are, anybody here from Maine? Uh, then you've explained. So Mainers have this whole culture. Um, it's practically Canada, what do you expect? Um, as you may or may not know, uh, so particularly if you're not from the US or even from the Eastern seaboard, it's like a 12 hour drive from here to the top of Maine. Okay. Maine is huge. But people don't realize it because the only part anybody lives in is like Portland, right? Which is like two hours. Away. So Mainers, despite them being Mainers, do not actually get triggered to be more likely to stay together based on their butter versus margarine consumption. Okay. So this might be true if you were a Californian, but not with Mainers. All right. And I feel perfectly happy to make fun of any U.S. state in case that wasn't clear. All right, so next we're going to move into Python again. Okay, so you've already done a little bit of Python. Okay, so I demonstrated in class. You may or may not have taken a pass at the homework, um, you know, either in the discussion last week or since then. Um, but what we want to talk about is what is Python? Okay, so funnily enough, I need to look this up. I don't actually know where Python gets its name. Um, as I think I may have said before, uh, there tend to be a lot of inside jokes in programming. So, uh, for example, there's a whole series of programming languages that are named after um, precious uh, stones. Okay, so there's Ruby and Perl, and there's a bunch of others too that I'm not thinking of, but those are the two big ones. Um, except Perl, of course, is spelled incorrectly and is actually an acronym. Um, so, Python is popular for both data science and general software development. Okay. So Python is actually one of the languages that's definitely on the upswing. People use it to make websites. People use it to do data science. 
People use it for all sorts of things. It has a lot of handy features that you can just kind of use it directly or you can run big applications in it. So the first thing you want to do is master the, a language's fundamentals. So basically what we refer to as the syntax of the language, okay? So if you think about it in terms of like uh, spoken languages, this is kind of the grammar of the language, okay? So kind of like what's the overall structure of the language? Then you add on vocabulary, right? So if you've ever learned another language, um, when you do, you know, you kind of learn, you often will learn a little bit of vocabulary first, which will then kind of show you the grammar, right? And then you kind of keep adding vocabulary essentially throughout the rest of your time speaking that language, okay? So similar with programming languages, what you want to kind of master is kind of the grammar. How does the rough language work? Then you can add vocabulary or basically all the things that it can do, okay? Or things that are built in that it can do. Um, one of the things that I think I've mentioned already is that when you're trying to learn a programming language, also very much like a spoken language, practice often is the kicker, right? That you can learn a certain amount kind of on paper, um, but if you don't practice it, if you don't use it, it's very, very difficult to learn. So that's why there's so much actual programming in this class. Um, you know, even if it's fairly straightforward programming, especially if you already come from a programming background, the reason you do so much practice is because if you want to learn that grammar and kind of the basics of the vocabulary, just doing it a lot helps immensely. Um, you got sound wrong? You good? Okay. Uh, all right. So know enough to ask questions of humans, Google, and Stack Overflow. So as you may or may not have experienced so far, if you're learning a new thing, um, I don't know, let's say economics. Anybody here in an economics class? Okay. So if you don't know what the difference is between micro and macro economics is, it's very hard to ask a question about uh, GDP, okay, or what GDP is, right? If you don't know that gross domestic product, okay, is a measure of the performance of a particular country, typically, sometimes smaller units, then it's very difficult to, to look for an answer. So that might be on the internet, okay, it might be asking people, it might be even, you know, God forbid, going to a library and actually looking things up in a library. Um, if you don't have enough to ask the question, it's really even more difficult. So what we're trying to get you here enough is that you have the basics of the grammar, a little bit of vocabulary, and enough knowledge around the thing to know how to talk about it and how to ask questions, okay? One thing that is very common in the programming community, and I would say even the data science community is even better at this, is that people expect other people to ask questions. Um, there is a lot, like, most of us think of ourselves as not very good at what we do, okay? So as a result, we expect people to ask questions. We expect people to ask dumb questions, okay? And we don't, and it, unless they're, you know, have other challenges, there's this whole like uh, subculture that is not a very good one where they'll judge you for it. But the vast majority, I would say, of programmers are perfectly happy to answer a question. One thing I will say that is also common amongst programmers, and I would say often amongst faculty members, they don't like to answer the same question twice for the same person, right? So if you ask a question, take notes, right? Keep track of the answer, because you don't like to ask a question twice, but asking the first time is usually fine. Um, and at least as far as I'm concerned, you ask me as many times as you want. Uh, and if the reason you didn't understand it is because I didn't explain it well, that's a lot different then you not remembering it and just coming back to me every time you ask a question, right? So that makes sense? All right. So as it says, demo. All right, so actually, let me this back over here for a second. So did everyone start a Jupyter Notebook already? I meant to put that on the announcements and I forgot. Um, okay, so if everybody's got one, then the first thing I want you to do and you're gonna do this in front of every class from now on, is we're gonna go and just do the file copy thing, okay, that we did for the homework. Uh, find the right thing. I'm in far too many projects and have far too many files. It's gonna load. So you can go to materials again, and now you'll see there's a folder called LEC, because programmers are lazy, 
So I can't type out the word lecture. That's far too much. Uh, so what you want to do is basically just like you would with the homework, copy that over into your student directory. That way you can follow along with what we're doing in class by typing in by hand. Um, depending on the lecture, there will be more or less kind of uh, like stuff already there. Okay. So I try to make it a balance between you um, kind of doing it for yourself and being able to keep up. Right. And I don't always do a great job there, but I do try. That's why not everything is there all at once. Um, and, you know, you got to have some like reveals. Right. So, uh, so there's that. All right. Everybody got this copied over? It's in the same place on the homework under materials. So you, you should see Project MD DS100 materials by going from here, files, Project MD DS100. And then to Jason, go to students in your name. Yeah. So to where to put it, you go to students. Oh, clearly you're all doing this right now. Yeah. <laughs> Might be dog slow. Make sure you're on 802 for Wi-Fi. Uh, but then you go to students and find yourself. Uh, just remember, you know, it's a long list. If you do control F or command F, you can type in the first part of your name and it should jump down to it. All right. And so you just put it into your own student directory. All right. Everybody got that? All right. So. All right. So everybody should be able to see that. So. All right, so one of the things that's handy about a Python notebook or a Jupyter notebook, uh, you'll hear me use those terms interchangeably. Technically speaking, it's called a Jupyter notebook, um, but it's common to call it a Python notebook because of where it comes from. So if I want to add two numbers together, I do two plus nine, okay? And apparently I will not. <laughs> Did the Wi-Fi die? Yeah. Does that make my day? Do, do, do. Somebody want to come up and do a little dance, maybe a stand-up routine, something? All right, looks like you're thinking about it. All right, progress. Clear the. All right. All right. So, trust me, this one following along, not that important. It's more just to kind of give you practice with it, get the idea. So, if you're not able to because the Wi Fi or whatever, it's, it should be okay. Do you have a question? All right. All right, so the first thing I can do is I can do this really cool thing. I can say two plus nine and I can get it to add it up for me. Okay, I can barely do arithmetic. Okay, like, and the reason is because I don't have a computer in hand, so I can always just look it up, right? So I rarely will do it. One thing that I've had multiple students come to me about over the past whatever few days is Python notebooks or Jupyter notebooks have. Um, different modes that these cells can be in. Okay, so each of these is called a cell. And one of the things that a couple of people have done by accident or magic or whatever um, is that the cell type, so this cell, the type was accidentally changed, okay? So if you want something that's gonna run, okay, that you can execute, it should be called code, okay? If it's something that's text like this part up here, that's in what's called a language called Markdown. 
If you're unfamiliar with Markdown, it just lets you do um, basic like word processing on text. So that you can do fancy things like make this bigger, okay? And the way you do it in Markdown, if you really want to get into it, is you just put a couple of hashtags in front of it and that will, when I render it, will actually make it bigger, okay? So, but it, that, if you notice, right, this cell is actually marked as Markdown. This cell is marked as code. There's another one that's called raw, which I don't actually remember what that does. So you probably don't need that. Uh, you won't need the Markdown one either. The reason I bring this up is because if this gets set to Markdown, well, I will not show you or not soon. If it gets set to Markdown and you try to execute it, it won't work, okay? It will fail, all right? And kind of inexplicably, like it just kind of won't do anything, all right? One of the tricks that you should get used to is that if you don't see anything being in different colors, that probably means that you're not in the right mode, okay? So if, you, if you're kind of staring at it, you don't understand why it's not doing anything or you're trying to grader check and it just doesn't seem to work, just check and make sure that if you don't have color in there, check to make sure that the cell type is still code, okay? Um, this rarely happens, um, but when it does, it's really annoying. So just keep that in mind. Does that make sense? All right, let me see if this will work again. All right, that's progress. So if you notice, hopefully nobody's too seriously colorblind. You see how it just went to all black? instead of like, it was like green and purple. That's because it changed the cell type and it also cleared the output. All right. Oh, it also drops these uh, uh, square brackets on the side. Um, all right, moving on. So we can do a bunch of different mathy things. Okay, mostly arithmetic, but we can also get more sophisticated about it. Right, and start to use parentheses, for example. What do parentheses do? Um, well, it's just like time to, well, it's time to, start to, time to, start to do what? PEMDAS. Like, yeah, so, but not everyone knows PEMDAS. Like, that is well, not the acronym they used when I was kid, for example. Right, well, doing whatever's inside the parentheses first. Right. Any other comments? Operations. Yeah, so order of operations. So, Generally speaking, the order of operations goes left to right, okay? Except there are certain rules which use um, the mnemonic called PEMDOS to tell to remind you of what the order is. Uh, does anybody know what that actually stands for? Right? How about all at once we can do all sing song? All right, first word. All right, nice. Like I said, I don't remember what the mnemonic was when I was a kid, but it wasn't that. And I was like, okay. Um, so basically when you're doing a mathematical expression, you have to do it in the right order. Otherwise it comes out with a different value. Um, and so you can do those and Python will follow the correct rules. All right. Now here's where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, certain programming languages use different techniques to indicate things that don't like have an obvious character for the thing. Okay, so like a plus sign, it's on your keyboard, right? It's really obvious what that is. I think most of you think of an asterisk now is essentially the same as a multiplication symbol, right? It's so common now, all right? But when you get into things like exponents, it gets a little weirder, right? Because you don't have to like type in something that's like super scripted or whatever, right? Or even subscripted. So usually in a programming language to make it easier to type, you just have tricky the tricks to do it, okay? So to do an exponent, you actually do two multiplication symbols or two asterisks in a row, and that indicates it's an exponent. So two to the fourth power, okay? Um, and then the last thing I'm gonna point out is you can also do kind of the same operations with just characters or with just letters by enclosing them in quote marks, okay? So this says, I don't want you to actually do anything with this except treat it as a unit, okay? So I'm not trying to add four to hello or whatever. I'm just trying to treat it as a unit of thing, okay? So when I put quotes right up around it like that, now just to be clear, there's a distinction often between double quotes, okay? So like what you think of as quote marks 
and two apostrophes, okay, which is what you see here. Okay, so they're usually interchangeable. I think throughout this course, they are pretty much interchangeable, um, but do keep in mind there is a distinction between the meaning of the two. Okay, also, they are not the same. So, in other words, if you do a quote mark here and an apostrophe here, it will give you an error. Okay, they have to match. That makes sense, everybody? All right. Back to slides. All right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is names, okay? So the formal term for this is assignment statements. Sorry, I thought I had a typo in there, but assignment statements, okay? Statements don't have to have a value, they perform an action. An assignment statement changes the meaning of the name to the left of the symbol, and this name is bound to a value, not an equation. So to expand on that, we have a name over here, which is hours per week, okay? But I wanna point out that the, why do we have underscores there? We have those underscores because a name has to be a single block, okay? Like if I had spaces in this, it would be three names. Does that make sense? Okay, so it has to be one thing. Um, this is why, for example, it bothers me a lot when people use file names, for example, and have spaces in them, okay? Because in my mind, if it's got a file name, it should be one thing, right? Just like these names, okay? So the shorthand, the nickname, the slang, the whatever, we just call it a name, okay? Um, and what we do is we can say, you know what? I wanna call this, or I want the value of this name to be the result of this expression, okay? So keep in mind that this last bullet, okay? It's not bound to the expression, it's bound to the value of the expression, okay? So in other words, it's gonna do the multiplication first before doing the assignment, which makes sense, right? So, but if you examine the result of this or the value that's in there, you're not gonna get 24 times seven, you're going to get the result of a multiplication. I mean, know what the result of the multiplication is? 168. 168. That sounds about right. Uh, I can't do a reference there. I would have typed it in a Python. All right. Any questions? All right. I have a question for you. So what is the blank box pointing to, aka what is it called? And I will start the question. Um, sometimes the font gets quite a bit smaller up there. So, oh, this is one of the ones that's stupid. Um, so yeah, it got, uh, it's, it's not rendering it very nicely. Um, but so what do we call this here? Oh, maybe it's gonna show it if I hit the next. Yeah. Okay. I have to remember the magic trick that gets it so that that is not tiny over to the side, but I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. All right, everybody get your answers in. All right, come on, 10 more, let's go. All right, moving on. So, largely, uh, looks like there was a fair amount correct, okay? So that, that part of this thing is the name. Can anyone tell me why assignment statement is incorrect? Exactly, the whole thing is the assignment statement. That piece on the left is just the name, all right? Does anybody know why somebody put variable here and that is technically correct? Uh, anybody else? All right, you tell me. Well, um, the, like the expression 24 times 7 is being assigned to like hours per week. So hours per week would be like a variable that can be used consistently like throughout where the program is running. All right, so how many people use the term variable in math class when they were younger? Okay. So variable and name are basically synonymous, okay? 
The only reason we use the word name is to remind you that it's essentially a label on the thing, okay? So, because when you think of variable, especially if you come from math, right, it's like X, right, or Y, okay? Which doesn't really tell you very much about that thing, unless you happen to talk about a graph. But, you know, if you're, if you're using a general variable, they tend to be all over the place. Although lots of them have important um, kind of definitions now, right? So you often know that an X or a Y probably means something to do with the graph, right? So I'll probably use the term variable quite a lot, but the reason I bring up name right now is just to remind you that it's a label for the value. It's not actually the value and it's not, so you can change it at any time, just like you can a variable, but it's a name for it. So you can reference that name elsewhere, okay? Uh, that's it. So I have typed in as the correct answer name, but as I explained, other ones are technically correct as well. All right, so let's move on to functions. Let me just see what my demo looks like. Yeah, actually, let's talk about. Uh, yeah, let's talk about functions. No, let's talk about names first of all. Okay. So we're actually going to switch to the demo again. Okay. So here we have names. Okay. So going back to that math example, here our name is just A. Okay. However, I just executed this, and what do you notice didn't happen? Anybody else? All right, how about over there? Yeah. There's no output. Why not? You haven't done the state like for whatever calling for any Exactly. So remember, computer dumb. Okay, it's only going to do what you tell it to do. Okay, what did I tell it to do here? Not quite. Yeah, keep going. Just the A. Right. So, so I did an assignment. Right. So I did. I did tell it to do something. But what didn't I tell it to do? Print the value. Right. I didn't tell it to print it. So it didn't print it. I just said assign it. That makes sense? So if I run A now, though, it has been assigned. It is now that is the value. If I wanted to do something that would be more useful as a human, I could have done that, right? And so I can do the assignment and then print out what the value is. But again, computer stupid, you must tell it exactly what you want, OK? So, wheat, okay? So I gave it a name, but I haven't assigned anything to it. And so I get this very convenient error. Name error, <laughs> name wheat is not defined. Seems plausible. So just kind of keep that in mind. When you're looking at the errors, usually the last couple of lines are what is gonna tell you the problem is. Okay, most of the part above that is uh, it's telling you context, but you usually don't need it, right? So I don't really care how it got to the fact that it is an unassigned name. All I care about the fact is that I made a mistake and didn't assign it first, right? Does that make sense? Sometimes I care about the context, but certainly not for this class. And most of the time, even with advanced sophisticated programming, you usually don't care. Usually there's enough here to say, oh, this is the stupid thing I did, okay? Or forgot to do. All right, so we can assign multiple things. So now we have B. Now it's gonna remember what A is, so I can now multiply it by three, okay? And then I can also print B, and then I can assign the result of multiplying those two numbers together, right? Into another variable or into another name. Okay, so what do, you, what do you all think total will be? It could be the result of three times nine, right? I'm oh, sorry, not three, my bad. Um, uh, whatever we assigned A to, four times 
9? Or is it the result of 12 times 9? 12 times 9. Want to do right and left hands? Or anybody have a theory? So what is the value that has been assigned to total? Okay. Is it, so remember A was originally assigned a four here, okay? And B was originally assigned a nine, but then we did this multiplication operation with A, okay? So is this result gonna be the original four times nine, or is it somehow the result of this? So 12 times nine, right there. I think it's gonna be the original value of A because you never reassigned another value, you just did an operation. Exactly. So I never changed A, right? I never put another equal sign there. So if there's no equal sign, that the value doesn't change, okay? So the total is uh, four times not. I'm like confusing myself with all the numbers I keep saying. Um, so that's how we get the 36. So now what if I reassign A to 27, what will total be? Okay, why? Because you didn't assign it. Right. So unless I reassign it, um, oh, another explanation here too, but unless I reassign it, nothing changes. Okay. So it's important. It's why I keep like I'm kind of harping on it. It's really important to remember that um, because the temptation for a lot of people is that because I'm changing the pieces, that that's going to change the result. But remember, I didn't assign the expression, I assigned the value to the name. That makes sense? So it doesn't know, total doesn't know anything about A anymore anyway. All it knows is the 36, okay? So one of the things that uh, I think is a little bit annoying about Jupyter Notebooks and is evidence here is, as you can see, I would expect to see A and total, right? Because I asked it to print both, but it only prints the last one. So just keep that in mind. If you want it to show you both, you can, but you have to do it a little different, okay? So that way you can at least just see both. It's not very good Python for anybody who actually knows Python, but it's handy if, if what you're doing is kind of, you know, checking your work, right? So just keep in mind, if you only see, you'll only ever see the last thing that you ask to get printed, most of the time. It's not consistent either. So that's fine. Most of the time. All right. So then we move on to why do we need these names? Okay. Why are they handy? Well, because humans, much like computers, are often dumb. Or actually, what computers do really well is remember things. And what humans do really well is think of things. Okay. But they're both really bad at the other one. Okay. So humans tend to be very forgetful, particularly compared to a computer. Okay. But computers can't think for themselves yet at all. Okay. So, what we do is instead of putting 40 hours right here, like just putting a 40 here, or the number of weeks in the year, which is 52, we'll put them in labels or names so that we don't have to remember what we were trying to accomplish. Does that make sense? Okay. And so, then next time when I come back to this, 20 minutes from now and have completely forgotten what I was doing, I can just read it, okay? And so it's really important when you're doing this kind of stuff to try to give good names, okay? This is why you shouldn't see uh, variable names or you know names that are A or B, okay? You should always see things that are words. So then, when you, like I said, when you come back to it a little bit later or the next person comes and looks at it, they know what you were trying to do. That make sense? Okay. Then we can assign that value into a new thing and we call that hours per year. So we know that when you're working, you have about 2080 hours in a typical work year. Okay. And at least in the US, most people remember the number 2000 because that's actually the number of working hours, really, because most people have two weeks or more vacation. So 2000 is a good rule of thumb if you want to know how many hours a person will work in a year. So if you're trying to calculate a salary, for example, using 2000 is pretty typical. 
All right, makes sense. All right, so then we might want to figure out, uh, and actually I think this just went up again and I think I didn't change it yet, but I think the minimum wage in Massachusetts is $14 an hour, I think, but it, I, it's like, it's on a scale to start going up, but I can't remember when the next trigger is. Um, so minimum wage is $14 per hour. So if you want to know how much you're going to get paid in a week, you take the number of hours per week, multiply it by the minimum wage, and then you can get your weekly wage. Okay, and this is before any sort of expenses like taxes or things like that, but this is how much you would make in a week. But then we can just easily do what is a yearly wage, okay? So if you make a minimum wage, at least the Massachusetts minimum wage, you'll be making $29,120 a year, okay? That makes sense to everybody? All right, but we can go back and see what we were trying to accomplish because now we can just read it, right? All right. Back to slides. All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is here, I'll leave it on here for a second, is what are called functions. Okay, so, um, yeah, that's cool. So the anatomy of a call expression. So uh, a function is kind of a, a loose term. It's kind of like variable versus name. Okay, we have a lot of different names for the same kind of construct, okay, in uh, programming languages. So one of them is a function, which is also sometimes referred to as a method, or in this case, it's called a call expression. Um, and I should really change my little, my little uh, magnifying glass up there because it may not be clear, but really what I mean is like, you should know what an expression is, um, but the important one here is actually what is a function. Okay, so a function, so you may remember this depending on how far you got in math, um, is basically an operation that you want to do, usually at least in math on a set of numbers. But when we're talking about Python, you are going to do it uh, for kind of anything. Okay, and so the way we read this is call f on 27, okay, where f is the name of your function or method. Okay. Uh, I use those two terms interchangeably all the time. So that's why I kind of, like, particularly early on in the semester, I tend to try to use both as much as I can. Um, so going back to my earlier example of having good names, okay, F is a terrible name for a function, right? It should describe at least vaguely what it does, okay? So because but right now, right, we're passing into 27, we have no idea what we're going to get from, right? We have no idea what F does. But for the example, what we're doing is we're calling F on 27 is how you describe it. Um, another way of saying it is you would say I'm passing 27 to the function F. Um, and so this part is called an argument, okay? And the thing that can go in here can be a variable or it can be what's called literal, okay? Which is like 27, okay? That makes sense? Else. Okay, so let's take a little bit more advanced one. Okay, now we have a function that actually does something, okay, or, or indicates what it does. But we can have an endless number of arguments. Okay, we don't, we're not limited to just one. Okay, so somebody who does not have a Python programming background, what do you think this function does? Right, so this will return whatever the max value is that you pass in, okay? So in this case, it hopefully it's gonna return 27 or it has a bug, all right? So let's see some demonstrations. Okay. So the first one we're gonna talk about this is a very common one to need in data science world. It's, if you come from a, a programming background, this is like a later one you learn because you don't use it that much. But when we're talking about numbers all the time, as we do in data science, this is a very useful one. Does anybody know what that will tell me? Okay, what is it though? 
the absolute value, right? So the absolute value is much more technically, right? Is uh, you know the actual amount, whereas in practice, right, it means it's always the positive version of the number. Okay. So when you aren't sure what you have, or you want to actively get rid of the fact of which end of the number line it's on, either one of those are common uses. Um, you can just use adds and you get five as promised, okay? And then we can assign that obviously to a variable and get the same thing. So, but it also gets better when you have something slightly more sophisticated where, especially if I don't, if I had passed in names here, right? And I don't know what those values are, then I can use expressions directly in there because, and this is where it's handy to know PEMDAS, PEMDAS, um, because if you think about it, the parentheses here kind of act the same way as they do in math. In other words, the stuff that's inside the parentheses will happen before the things that are on the outside of the parentheses. So in other words, the three will be subtracted from one before the valid, that result is passed to the function as. Okay? And as you might imagine, you can cascade that, right? You can put a function inside of another one, and it's kind of you just kind of keep thinking about those parentheses. Yeah. Are you regular to our, like, you just say call f on 27, there's two. You usually just say and. So, like, I don't remember what the other example was, but you call ads on three and 27. Oh, that wouldn't make any sense at all. You call max on three and 27. How's that? Um, so, typically, or you would say in the reverse, you'd say, you know, um, I'm passing 27 and three to the max function. Okay. So, that's the way I remember it is that the parentheses will happen first. The other thing that's interesting is that the parentheses will also happen first if there's more of them. Okay. So, assuming I can get my parentheses right. And then. Oh, I dropped them. I dropped them minus sign. Sorry. So. These parentheses happen first, right? And then the function parentheses happen, and then the actual function happens. Okay. All right. So then we can start to do things that are slightly more sophisticated, like I described, which is that let's see, we assign a day temp and a night temp, you know, so like the what's the uh, the high and the low, uh, you know, 52 degrees and 47 degrees. Um, this is either a pretty cool day in Boston or a very warm day in India, okay? Depending on whether you follow Fahrenheit or Celsius. Um, and so this is maybe the range that you wanna find out between the two temperatures. But as you can see, right, in this case, I really don't care whether the result is negative or positive. What I care about is what's the range between the day temperature and the night temperature. Does that make sense? That's why I might use absolute value instead of looking at the real number. All right, and then we have conveniently a few other functions. We get min, which will give us the minimum of two, and then the maximum of two, and then we can round numbers, okay? And what I wanna point out here is the ones that we've looked at so far, so like max, okay, the 14 and the 15, those, those are kind of the two things I wanna like operate on, okay? They're not really kind of changing the behavior of the function I'm calling. Now in round, we can change the behavior of the function. So two things I wanna point out here. First of all, there's a default. So you don't have to specify the second argument, okay? The second argument here is implied as comma zero. Oops. So, and I changed it from a float to an int, which we'll talk about later, um, but, as you can see, it's the same answer, right? I still get 123 because the second argument, if you don't pass it, it has a default, okay? And so it will just use zero every time so that you don't have to pass comma zero every time. That makes sense? Because that's the most common way people use it. However, let's say I want to modify the behavior, okay? 
And so instead of rounding to the, you know, to the zero if place, right, I want to ground to the first place. Okay, so this actually modifies the behavior of this function by passing a one, which means give me one digit after the decimal. That makes sense? Okay, so it's important to know your defaults if you have them when you're using a function like round, for example, right? Because if you assume that it's gonna give you two digits because you think you're operating on currency where, you know, like change matters, okay? Um, but you use a round without passing a two, right? That's gonna be a big deal. So just kind of keep in mind that many, many arguments, uh, sorry, many, many methods, functions, will have uh, defaults for some of the arguments, okay? Usually it's the most common way that thing is used, but it's the most common in general, not the most common for you, right? So even if you do currency all day, this is still gonna screw you up. Make sense? All right. So I think we go back to the slides here. Let me just check. Yes. Well, actually, we'll stick with, we'll go a different way. Um, so let's talk about tables. So last time we talked about, I think it was last time, we talked about what a table is, right? So I think of these as just grids, okay? You have rows, right, that go like this, and you have columns that go like this. Typically, a row, all of the elements of that row are related to each other, okay? Like as in, the row indicates an individual thing, whereas a column usually indicates a particular type. So for example, if we had a table of cones, we might have three different cone types, okay? So in other words, ice cream cone types. So we have a strawberry flavored ice cream, okay, that is pink, and it really, I guess these are ice cream flavors more than they are cones, but you get the idea. Um, so strawberry, then pink, and the price of it is $3.55, okay? But then we have another thing, right, which is chocolate ice cream, which is light brown and $4.75. But then we have another type of chocolate that is dark brown at $5.25. That makes sense? But so each of these is a thing, and then each of these is more like a class or a category something like that, right? And we have formal words for that that we'll talk about in a couple of lectures. Um, so these are related, but they're not all the same thing, right? Each row is the same. So this isn't always true, right? Because the data that comes in may be like rotated, right? But usually when we're trying to manipulate the data such that we can kind of consume it or use it or show it to somebody else, we'll rotate it such that this is true, okay? So that Generally, a row is like a thing and a column is like a category. Does that make sense? All right. So in um, one of in the library we're using a Python called data science, there is a thing called a table. And what a table can do, this object can do, is it can read a file called cones.csv. And if you look over here and in your directory, you'll see there is a file in that same directory, if you look next to it, called cones.csv. That CSV file just has that data in it, okay? And this table is basically just getting read out of it, and then we're just printing it out. It will cap, I think it'll only show five rows by default normally, um, and then it'll just tell you how many uh, more there are to display. And you can display more if you want, but most of the time that's enough to get a sense of what it is. So the table has a bunch of nice operations on it. We can show a, two rows out of it, okay? It'll be the top two rows if we just give it a number. So here's where I could say 300, and assuming I had 300 different flavors of ice cream, I would get 300, okay? But then I can also do select, okay? And what that does is instead of um, kind of giving me anything about the rows or giving me about the whole table, it says, you know what? I just want this one column, okay? And that one column is called flavor, okay? So I have to write it exactly the same way. So notice the capital F, okay? And then I will get that one column back, 
but I lose all the other information, right? So this is just flavor. So if I want to know all of the available flavors, I could get that. Make sense? All right. Um, and actually, if you notice, right, that's going to error. Um, this is not going to error because I can use a, uh, a name just like I would elsewhere as long as I've assigned it first. <coughs> Sorry. Now, I can also do the reverse, which is where instead of just getting one column, I want to drop this data. Okay. So, in this case, what I did was I took that original table and I got rid of the price. Okay. So, if you have 67 different columns and you're only interested in some of them, if you're interested in five of them, it's probably better to use select. If you're interested in 60 of them, it's probably better to use drop. Right. So it's just a convenience, whichever way is faster for you, you know, with the least amount of time typing to get the thing you actually want. All right. Now, what we can do, though, is we can actually assign the result of dropping price, for example, to a new table. OK, so this has all the same operations on it that we had a minute ago, except it's on a new one and it only has two columns. OK. Now, what we can also do is we can, oh, where do I go? There we go. The next thing we can do is we can do what's called filtering or also referred to as searching, okay? The, I would say the generic term is to search something, but we more formally usually say filter because we're not really searching. We're not going and finding the first time we see chocolate. We're filtering. Instead, we're saying remove everything that isn't chocolate. I know it's kind of a like a fine line difference, but that's what it means when we say filter versus search. Okay. Um, and so we use a where, okay, intuitively enough. So in other words, where the flavor column is equal to chocolate. Follow me? All right. But then we have some other cool functions like we can sort by the price. Okay. So we can see. Clearly, if you want the cheapest ice cream you can get, it's strawberry, which makes sense because it's also the least good. I will throw shade at anything and everything in this class. Uh, all right, but then I can do it in reverse too if I want to know what the most expensive is, okay? By modifying the behavior by passing another argument, okay? Except in this case, I'm going to actually tell it which argument I want to modify, okay? So it's not just what's called a positional argument, it's the next, it's the actual name of the argument. We're going to go through this more in the slides. So don't worry about it if we're kind of getting a little beyond your capacity for straight memorization. Um, but so what do you guys think here? If I pass descending equals true, okay? So that means I'm going to get, go down, right? What does that mean that this is when I'm using the default? Okay, so if I don't pass it, what do you think that the equivalent would be if I did want to pass it? So what's the equivalent of the zero in round in this case? Any ideas? So it does, but how would I replicate that? Because what the, the reason it does that is because it's defaulting somehow. Keep going. Instead of descending goes through, it will reverse. That. So it reverses it, but how do I get it so that it was like it was before? Here, why don't you try so if I could put nothing there, but let's say I want to actually put it there. Descending equals false. So in other words, we know that the default here, oh boy, that's not going to work at all. looks like this. So to your point over there, um, if I let this off, it implies descending equals false. Does that make sense? Because it's now going in um, ascending order, okay? Or descending false, right? Depending how you want to say it. So you can drop 
columns and tables, right? Yep. So what is the purpose of creating a new table from that drops that instead of just viewing it as? Uh, usually it's because you don't care about that data and it's expensive to carry it around. So like I was giving an example of you have 67 columns and you have 100,000 rows, dropping five columns out of that will be a materially less amount of data. And it generates a new table, like a, a file of database, or is it? No, no, no. It's just creating another object that is just like this table, except without those columns. So in the case where, actually, this is a good case. So in this case, I'm generating a new table of cones that only has these three rows, but because I'm not assigning it to anything, I'm just throwing it away as soon as I print it. Oh, I'm just saying, because it's pulling from an actual file in the directory, the cones, like spreadsheet. Is only it originally. Okay. So the file, which we drag, we read it here, will never be modified with the operations we're doing. Okay, so cones.csv, which is just a file with, and CSV is comma, comma separated values. Okay, so it's literally a file with commas in between the flavors and the color and the price. That will never be modified in all of these kinds of operations. You can modify it, but that's not what we're doing. More questions? All right, let's try to go back to the slides, try to cover this a little bit. We may run out of time. Oh, sorry. All right, so a table is a sequence of labeled columns, okay? So they always, or they should always have a label, okay? Which is what's in this column, okay? They can be multi-word, they can be short, they can be long, they can have good capitalization, they can have bad, but they should have a very clear indication of what is in the column, okay? So we had flavors, we had prices, we had, uh, colors here. This is talking about a zip code. Uh, no, sorry, size of uh, an area. Okay, so the size of the state of California is whatever that says, one hundred sixty-three thousand and a half square meters. Okay, <laughs> it's in meters, so I don't know what that means, but it's big. All right, and it's bigger than Nevada's, which is one hundred ten thousand some odd square meters. Okay. So this part at the top is called the label, okay? And it labels a column, okay? And then as we've mentioned several times, right, we have a row. So if you, like I said, I kind of think of these as things, right? And these as categories, all right? Any questions? All right. So here are some of the operations that you will start to use very quickly. Okay, maybe I want to say maybe in the first lab, maybe in the first next homework. But one of the things, as we've said before, is that we shorthand things a lot. Okay, so imagine the T here is the equivalent of cones. Okay, so T is some table. We don't know what it is. We don't care. We can do a select on it and give it the label name. Okay, and that will give us just that column out of that table. We can also do a drop with a label name and we can get rid of that column in the output. We can do a sort by label name, okay, and then we also have the descending option, right? And then we can also do a where, which lets us do a label with a particular condition. All right, make sense? One more, I think there's a couple of questions and then we will probably break. Okay, so if you only want a specific column, which operation is that? So you wanna retain a particular column. How do you do that or, or get? One of those things where it's very hard not to say the keyword. <laughs>
All right, quick, quick. Remember it, the the getting uh, uh, giving an answer in this is way more important than the answer being correct. So get those answers in. All right, hopefully this is the right button. Yes. Okay. And it looks like largely you got it correct. So it is select. So remember, it's not drop, which would get rid of a column. It's select. I want to retain column or set of columns. All right. And then we have another question. So if you want to get rid of a row from a table, what operation would you apply? Oops. Where's the question? Go? Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, I was saying that I didn't realize it was free writing. Oh, this also has a typo in it. It's not a middle row, it's a middle column. Sorry. So if you answer the other one, we will explain it as why it's perfect in every way. So if you want to admit a column from a table, so unlike the other one where we wanted to retain a column, this is getting rid of a column. What's the difference between select and sort? So select retain certain columns. Sort doesn't change which columns you have. It just says, I want to sort it by that column. So instead of being sorted by price, you want to sort it by color. Thank you. But it doesn't get rid of either one. Uh, it doesn't matter that much. It, the keyword is the keyword. But I mean, when you're Oh, yeah, we'll be talking about that in a second. Okay, so these top two. I would say are both correct, as in they both answer the question, okay? However, this one can actually do something to kind of your point. So you need to have, when you're actually using it, you need to have what table you want to drop stuff from, right? Whatever that might be, okay? And you have to tell it which column you want to drop. Otherwise, what's the point, right? So if you did T dot drop, Parenthesis, parenthesis. What do you think would happen with no label? There, there. So I heard error and I heard drop everything. Um, my guess is that it will actually give it back to you unchanged, or it will error and say, "Why didn't you tell me what label to drop?" Um, it will not remove them all. Um, so. Generally speaking, most of these tools, most things when you're programming will err in the side of not breaking things. So in other words, it's way more likely not to do anything than it is to destroy everything. Does that make sense? So if you have a, um, if you had a column with, with no name, could they just end up deleting that? Because it's so if you had a column with no name, first of all, I think that's illegal. Uh, um, second, Probably not. What you'd have to do is find a way to still name that column. So, and you can actually, because you can actually do it by position. So you could still say drop three, like the number three, and that would be drop the third column. All right, one more, and then I think we're done today. All right. So this one's like a mapping thing. Oh yeah, why does it make it so small? I don't understand. Um, see if I can. You all should be able to see this to yourselves, right? Um, but basically, you just do a mapping of, and now I cut this part off over here. But which one of those? goes in here, which one goes in here, which one goes in here. Um, so if you need to look at it on your computer or your phone or whatever, it should be a little bit bigger. Uh, I had a fix for this. I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh, 
I'll be very impressed if the back of the room does better than the front of the room on this one. All right, get those answers in. And let's continue. All right, still super slow. All right. Um, 